Um, so Olivier is a, a partner at Steamboat Ventures, which uh, you will do the requisite. You're not Disney, but you are Disney talk. Correct. So, so <laughs> good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here. I think this is my fifth or sixth year. I've been, I've been at Chennai City a few times. Initially, it started with a specifically more of a bringing European companies right. here in China, and I think now it's turned into more Chinese companies as well as uh, US companies, which is great. So, so a brief introduction. Steamboat Ventures, we like to call ourselves a uh, venture capital fund with a corporate affiliation. We, we're not a corporate VC, uh, and I'll explain the difference. The difference is we are structured uh, like a traditional venture capital fund, but we only have one limited partner in the fund, which is the Walt Disney Company. Uh, and then again, it explains the, the name uh, of the, uh, the fund. Uh, Steamboat Willie was the first animated uh, character, the first time uh, ever that there was uh, synchronized sounds and image. So this was a great technology innovation. So hopefully that's happening on the streaming right now. And it's happening, uh, hopefully it's happening right now as well. So that innovation goes on. And this is the reason why we, we called that uh, Steamboat Ventures. The fund was started in 2000. Um, initially with a fund in the US, we've got about 600 million dollar under management. Uh, in 2007, we started uh, an Asia fund of 175 million, and it's ended up being mainly focused on China. Uh, initially, uh, it was uh, Asia minus Japan and India. The reality is all of our investments have been in China. Uh, and again, myself as background, I'm originally from Europe, uh, spent quite some time in the US, and I've been for the last uh, seven years now here in China. Uh, so a product of globalization. Absolutely, I think we all are actually. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully people can understand what we're saying. <laughs> so in terms of uh, bubble or no, I mean, I think it was something we looked at. Obviously, uh, certain people are calling bubbles and not, others are not. I mean, is it just too simple, simplistic? It sells newspapers or magazines. It, it but does, but I, I think um, <laughs> there's always a, so four words that um, are a little bit dangerous when you start hearing them, and it's like this, this time it's different. And I think we're, you're hearing this again, that uh, people are sort of acknowledging, yes, there might be a bubble, but this time it's different because uh, a few reasons. Um, I, I did start my venture capital career in 2000 at the tail end of the last bubble, um, and I definitely see some... Uh, some matching patterns here in the sense that you, you sometimes have um, in the, the, the investments that are happening specifically in the venture capital market sort of a suspension um, of belief or sort of rational economics sort of, of checked out where, where valuation in terms of multiples become extremely high with the hope that eventually it will catch up. So I have no, uh, no doubt that LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, many of these companies are actually great companies, uh, extremely uh, valuable, have great business model. However, I think what is happening is on the public market side, some valuation are getting ahead of themselves uh, for sure. And on the private side, there is um, specifically too much hope that every company can eventually become the next Facebook uh, or the next Google or be acquired by one of them. Um, so we, especially in the, we typically invest in internet, e-commerce, uh, new media, digital media. We definitely are seeing uh, valuation creeping up uh, significantly. I, I came here first in 2003, and in some of our first Series A investments, my first investment was in a gaming company. This was with it Qualcomm. Was, this was, was with yeah. Qualcomm, a $3.5 million investment, oh, yeah. and this was considered a very large <laughs> Series A. And then we just heard from uh, Harry that now it's 5 to 10 million minimum. Of course, there's inflation in China, but very often more money is being raised just because you can, not necessarily because you need it. Mm. And, and eventually that might create some trouble. So, so from our standpoint, we're, we're very we're cautious. I see. But uh, that doesn't stop you from investing, it's just being more selective, I guess. Uh, it doesn't stop us from investing. Uh, we are becoming more selective for... This situation is great once you have a, a portfolio of companies because, again, they, they can raise more money um, at a much higher valuation. So we, we were fortunate to have a few of these uh, cases where mm -hmm. our past companies have uh, raised now significant am amount of money. So I think what you should do in this situation, if you're a startup, is definitely raise as much money as you can but be very careful on how you spend it, because I do believe there will be a correction. Um, and I, do like, you see that um, beginning now? Or, I mean, it's uh, not really, actually, not really yet. I think not, not in the venture, not in the private markets. So we, I think there's some in the public, but not. There's on the, some little bit happening on the public side, mm -hmm. uh, but not yet on the on the private side. And what would it take for that to really happen? Obviously, collapse of the public, or. or I mean, some of that's been driven by corporate governance issues or valuation issues. I mean, is there anything systemic that you see 
uh, as a risk right now uh, at, at the early stage side? Or so, so I think, again, early stage is um, what, once company, the risk is these companies, when a bubble crashes, I would say, in the venture or the private markets, hmm. it doesn't necessarily have an effect because eventually right. it will burn some limited partners and investors. I think uh, in terms of macroeconomic, a public market crash is much yeah. more Different. dangerous. Hmm. Um, but obviously you need just valuation to start rationalizing a little bit uh, in the U.S. in this sector, and this definitely, again, will will have an effect on, on the private markets. Um, as these companies, uh, if you look at in the U.S., typically what, what fuels also these, uh, these hype in valuation is you have large companies such as, again, Google, Facebook, uh, now LinkedIn, who went public, who make large acquisition, and they will buy private companies. This is not, I would tend to disagree not, a little bit yeah. with uh, Harry, this is not happening as much, as much yeah. in China. Uh, these companies will acquire, but they will never pay a very large price. You're not, and we haven't seen any uh, significant uh, acquisition by a publicly Chinese-listed company in China buying a company for more than 100 million. There's right. very, very few. Right. Where, so, so the type of YouTube type of uh, acquisition, which is more, okay, I'm buying a platform, is not happening. I think the Chinese entrepreneurs want to buy growth. Mm -hmm. They want to buy growth in EPS if they can. They don't necessarily want to buy a long-term uh, platform. Right. So Baidu is not going to buy uh, y Yoku or uh, probably not. <laughs> Even though you might <laughs> start seeing, now, but, yeah. you might start seeing these type of consolidation. Again, it might be forced by the by, by the pub public markets uh, right. eventually. So which trends do you see? We were talking a little about mobile. Do you have any insights as you've worked a long time in well, the mobile area? Yeah, definitely. I think now is uh, I think there's, there's two trends which uh, maybe might be linked. But uh, one great trend, the other one troublesome. The first great trend is. Finally, in mobile, you used to be stuck between these huge operators with very large power yes. and the handset manufacturers with also a lot of power. And it was quite difficult to really carve yourself uh, a niche in a business. Mm. Uh, we, we were fortunate to have some good exit in the, in the past in this sector, uh, but it was definitely a very tough uh, road. You had to be really, really good at entertaining the mobile operator uh, as well as the handset manufacturers. Now, thanks to, to Apple and the iPhone, you finally, as we talk, we have this app platform that you can finally uh, open and distribute to the world. I, I was, I, I really dawned on me, I think, uh, two years, a year and a half ago, I was talking to a, actually a German company which was doing uh, a German service, mobile gaming company, and they were telling me, well, the, the biggest market is Indonesia. We've never been there. We don't know anyone in Indonesia. Mm. It's a number one market. It's just because you suddenly have this, uh, this scale. Uh, the gatekeeper now is, on the other hand, is Apple, so that's uh, mm. a little bit more, more troublesome. But and with, Blackberry in Indonesia. And Blackberry, but with the arrival of Android, <laughs> with the arrival of Android, then you have more choice. So yes. I think that's great. Finally, you can distribute. The number one challenge was how to distribute your application, distribute your content, and that is happening. We are seeing definitely valuation in mobile are getting also bid up very quickly. And again, I think there's a huge excitement about Android. The reality is Android is a great platform, has a great potential future. No one is really making any money it's in Android free yet. Apps, right? I mean, it's mainly free app, yeah. and there isn't yet a proven business model. So um, we definitely are spending a lot of time there because the potential is gigantic. And I think Android is going to be successful because it's not Apple. It's just the alternative uh, platform. There might even be room for an it's not Apple and it's not Android platform in China uh, because, again, both are sort of U.S. controlled, U.S. dominated, and I think China has been looking for its own mm -hmm. application and platform, has probably flexed. unfortunately not with a lot of success. Not yet, not yet. Um, but yeah. it might happen. Mm -hmm. So how many devices do you carry? So I carry, <laughs> <laughs> I carry two devices, a BlackBerry, simple BlackBerry uh, for work, and then uh, iPod Touch mm -hmm. for entertainment and application, market research, I see. All right. uh, okay. and others. <laughs> So beyond mobile, uh, e-commerce scenarios? Or do we so, so yeah, we definitely yeah. are. We've done uh, so. So we our investments. We've been somewhat focused. We, right. we have ten portfolio companies and four sectors: online video distribution, uh, online marketing, online. Uh, so there's a lot of online, as you can tell. Online advertising and e-commerce. Um, we definitely e-commerce is growing extremely fast, and I think we we've been making our last three investments were in online advertising because this is the great corollary of uh, e-commerce. So a lot of money is going into e-commerce for obvious reason. Um, it's much easier to payment system. Payment issues have been solved. It's a very convenient way to buy. Um, you, now the internet reaches critical mass in terms of reaching users, so it just makes perfect sense. Huge growth in e-commerce. A lot of companies, money going into e-commerce, so therefore online advertising, how do customer acquisition is number one. Um, so we're seeing online advertising as a very exciting field. And, in China, traditionally, 
online advertising has been a very simple sort of 80% of online advertising is what we call CPDs or per display. So it's like renting a billboard. So you're using a, an amazing technology, the internet, to basically rent space by the day on a portal page, which is huge inefficiencies. So we've made investments in that sector, online advertising, because if you look at that market in the, in the US, it's amazingly sophisticated. The online advertising market It's true technology. Has, it's it's not, true technology, yeah. real-time auction bidding, right. uh, uh, demand-side platforms, and so on. So we've made a few investments in these sectors, and we're actually, these companies are doing extremely well, growing extremely fast, taking advantage of both inefficiencies in online advertising, but also Again, the rise of e-commerce. These investments you described are in the U.S. So these investments are actually in China. China. So they, China. they are at the leading edge of this yes, shift to, to technical. So yes. that's happening. So now, we, we've uh, we've got one company that we we invested about a year and a half ago, and and we're seeing this happening very quickly. Okay. Uh, again, they they bring true technology, audience measurement, audience targeting, uh, and they've seen a tremendous growth again mm -hmm. because. Um, e-commerce uh, is here and then now online advertising online is just such a great uh, way to reach consumers and finally there's some efficiencies coming into the into the market. I see. And online marketing was another you mentioned? So yeah, online marketing. marketing so online, online, advertising, online marketing said, yeah. advertising would be the... E-commerce, mobile. The same. The, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of the fund environment, again, RMB versus US, I mean, are you seeing it's still quite distinct? And, you know, so, so it is distinct, but we definitely... So, so I think we've been fortunate to a certain extent to be very focused, right. specific in our investments, which mainly TMT, technology, media, telecom, where RMB funds are not really yet active, but we were seeing a lot of competition from RMB funds. Mm -hmm. Um, in a way, it makes sense. Traditionally, in China, everything, all, all the structure, investment structure, were via offshore vehicles in US dollar, and then the exits happen offshore. It doesn't necessarily make sense for China long term, the second largest economy, to outsource its capital sure. markets. Yes. Uh, so they want to develop their domestic market. It makes perfect sense. They should. Um, so RMB funds tend to, they, I think they have a very different profile. They, they focus on later stage. They have a very short-term horizon in terms of exit, so they want to see an exit within six to uh, probably six to sometime maximum 12, 18 months, mm -hmm. and they invest only in profitable companies, traditional industries. So it hasn't been too much of competition yet, but we're seeing that that's changing. And I think for U.S. dollar funds uh, in the future, that might become more challenging. Uh, eventually, you'll have to you'll need to have R&B fund and have a RMB presence. Yeah, there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about you know the, some of the U.S. dollar funds like uh, being used for inbound China investments, so uh, or, or also facilitating Chinese companies' expansion overseas. So the U.S. dollar element becomes you know sort of the currency of that cross-border stuff, as opposed to as you said, outsourcing the capital markets, which yeah. which isn't tenable in the long in Doesn't the long make term. Sense. Yeah. But also, I think the next I think the next big trend, and that's where uh, also I think foreign investors can help, is for Chinese companies to really expand overseas as the markets. Uh, saturate, eventually a lot of these companies are going to start expanding overseas. Uh, China, if you, second largest economy, is only 6% of the world, China represents 6% of foreign direct investment in the world. That's actually tiny. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, if you look at the US at its peak, it was 50% in right. 19, and the UK in 1914 was 50%. So China will, from 6% to at least it needs to go to 20, 30%. That's a huge amount of capital. Yeah. So, so the next big challenge and reward for Chinese company will be to expand overseas, build brand distribution overseas. Uh, they're also going to be looking at acquiring assets. Assets are very expensive now in China, but now in Europe you've got great technologies at depressed prices. You can uh, buy Greece. It's, <laughs> buy Greece, <laughs> buy an island. But you, again, you also have great technologies, great <clears throat> brands, and we started seeing this, so I think we'll see more and more. That's going to be a big trend. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. The uh, people, this is the same in the 80s with the, you know, perceived wave of Japanese investment in the US, and yet the biggest investors still were the UK and the Netherlands in the US, but because of visibility of something new, and I guess that's what we're going through with, with the Chinese outbound investment. Even Africa, we hear a lot of talk, it's only 10% perhaps of the foreign investment, but it's just so visible and so yeah, new. Yes. But, but also, so it's, it is, uh, if you look at the Chinese brand, we, which try to name sort of famous Chinese brands that are known overseas, it's actually quite a few. I mean, Huawei, ZTE, right. uh, but that's about it. But then you think about Korea, Japan, the, the, especially consumer electronics, uh, they're just extremely long list of well-known brand automotive and so on. So I think that's going to be a next. But, you know, Baidu and others have talked about the international expansion and saying, you know, Robin Lee had said a household name within I think ten years, two years. How, you know, 
does the skill set exist there within these these tech companies? And I mean, should they even look at this international expansion? I think they are looking. So the first the first market that's been looking in TMT is actually mm. gaming, mm. and a lot of it because you see saturation right. happening in China now. Suddenly, the traditional online MMO games, the market is starting to saturate. So they naturally looked at overseas expansion. Um, I think they will sometimes find it harder uh, to to do that, just in terms of how to approach foreign markets, how to, there's going to be some cultural differences, so. And Tencent right. obviously leverages its balance sheet by, you know, through uh, DST, getting them into Zynga. And yeah, Facebook absolutely. And Tencent has probably, been very, it, yeah. it's a very impressive company. Yes. Uh, yeah. One company that we can really admire that has a very long-term view perspective. And they, yes. they've been quite smart about mm -hmm. expanding uh, overseas. And they've made a few, they haven't made a lot of acquisition. Yeah. Smaller but investments. They, they, but, uh, they've made investments, yeah. smart investments. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But I think that's, that's uh, definitely a next trend for some of these companies to, to expand overseas. Uh, traditional internet, I think Baidu, there's still a lot of, so much opportunities and growth here. Um, but gaming, again, gaming is the first one. Consumer electronics, it's going to be obvious. Semiconductor, mm -hmm. these are all sectors where it's a natural for, thing for, for Chinese companies to do. As you and I, friends, we could just sit here talking forever, but I'm going to look at my watch <laughs> and so, uh, no, I think we're approaching the end. So any last comments or reflections on, as we... I think Move into the uh, Friday. It's TGIF now. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, 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 the heaven, I, I've spent quite some time in, in the U.S. investing, yeah. sometime in China, sometimes in Europe. And I, I, I have to say that the, being in China is such an exciting, uh, I think previous speaker have talked about the, the pace, the velocity. What I found the most motivating and the most exciting in China is just the energy uh, of the people. Uh, and I think uh, even though the, we talked about bubble, there's probably some, going to be some correction. Mm -hmm. I'm still extremely bullish about the long-term prospects mm -hmm. uh, in China just because of the energy uh, that there is in this country, the velocity, uh, the, the number of entrepreneurs, the, 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 the hunger and then the, the talent of these entrepreneurs. I definitely agree that the more human capital repeat entrepreneurs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, that's makes it such an exciting place. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, to be investing. Yeah, because the French don't even have a word for entrepreneur. Just kidding. That was <laughs> exactly. George Bush, but no. Well, they'll rediscover it, maybe in Chinese. That, that was George Bush's famous quote. It was, quote, absolutely. Yes. So, <laughs> on that note, uh, sorry, <laughs> we will, we'll end this and move on to our next speaker. Thanks, Olivier. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat>